Hello, my name is Doro Tom Popovich, and I'm going to talk to you about some interesting work about techniques to optimize applications for future hardware. I'm a postdoc in the CCMC group. I've been here at the lab for almost two years now, and I'm interested in compilers, computer architecture, and algorithms. More specifically, I'm interested in this interaction between these three domains. This actually leads me to the motivation for this talk. And uh, we know that hardware is changing and we need to adapt to these changes. So supercomputers at some points uh, used, uh, relied on powerful general, pro uh, general purpose processors to offer performance for various applications. And because of the increase in frequency, typically performance was obtained for free. Like developers didn't have to waste so much time on getting the performance because by increasing the frequency each year by a factor of two, typically that would result in an increase in, in performance by also a factor of two. Now, recently though, the increase in frequency has been starting to taper off. And therefore, um, uh, what do you call, other paradigms have been adopted. So for example, NVIDIA and AMD, opted for instead of using like a general purpose beefy strong core they opted for these small cores multiple small lightweight cores that execute in parallel now the burden of achie achieving performance of these systems now falls on, on developers because now they have to understand how to parallelize the code on these sort of systems how to do the load balancing how to efficiently utilize the system to actually get the performance out of it Things are also now looking very great moving forward because there's this tendency of moving towards these specialized hardware. So instead of having cores or chiplets that would do the same kind of computation, each of these cores would do a specialized operation. So they will be simply focused on one given or a set of operations and they will do it very, very efficiently. So this evolution from a CPU to a GPU to move, moving forward to specialized hardware raises the questions of how do we adapt software moving forward? And this is an important question for a multitude of DOE workloads, like applications for molecular dynamics, particle and cell simulation, stress strain analysis, density function theory, because all of these applications will have to execute either on current systems on for, uh, or on future systems. Now, of course, in this talk, I'm not gonna talk about all applications, I will simply focus on density functional theory because 25% of the nurse workload is spent in doing these computations. So applications like QBox, VASP, Quantum Espresso, Berkeley GW use a lot of hours on Cori to do these sort of computations. Now, in this talk, I'm, all, I'm going to focus more on this LS3DF formulation for density functional theory. So this LS3DF algorithm implemented here at Berkeley is a communication avoiding algorithm that's meant to scale on thousands of nodes by reducing the amount of data that's being that's being communicating between the compute nodes. The principle is that you divide the volume into these fragments and you pass the fragments to each of the compute nodes. The compute nodes would do the same operations as outlined on the right hand side of the slide at some points, they would simply they will have to synchronize, pass small amounts of data to update their states, and then continue computation. So, as I said, each of the compute nodes would get a fragment. They will have to do the computation outlined on the right hand side, which can be seen. It can be seen that it's simply like the basic linear algebra operations, or in some of the sense, some computations will involve Fourier transforms, and typically these computations will be implemented using library calls. Now, in order to optimize this application, we need to understand where the time is going to be spent in. So in order to do that, if we actually run for a specific problem size on a single compute node, on a single CPU, for example, we can see where the time is spent in. So on the y-axis, on the y-axis, we see the different components, and we can see that a lot of the time outlined on the x-axis is spent in doing this FFT computation, H time psi computation, and inverse FFT. So if we were to optimize these calculations, we would optimize the overall execution of the code. Now, if we zoom into the uh, FFT, H time psi, inverse FFT, we see that the computation has eight components. So the input is first zero padded, so the data is going to be padded with zeros and the amount of data is going to be increased by almost 16 times. A, free, a 3D inverse FFT is applied. 
then an, a pointwise computation. The data is also projected on these non-local projectors, which are sparse because the non-local projectors are going to be centered around the atoms of the system that we want to analyze. The results are going to be accumulated, then passed through a 3D FFT. And finally, they're going to be unpadded. So the amount of data is going to be shrunk by 16 times back to the original size, and only some of the data points are going to be extracted. That Those results are going to be updated by the pointwise scaled version of the input, and the output is going to be returned. Now, typically, these steps are going to be implemented using library calls. So, for example, for the FFT, we can use FFTW on the CPU, or we can use QFFT on the GPU. The same goes for, like, the block sparse operations. These are going to be implemented with uh, library calls to specific sparse linear algebra uh, libraries. Now, if we were to optimize this, an important aspect of all of these computation is that, well, all of them are going to be memory bound. So they simply depend on how fast you can bring data from main memory into the compute units. So whether you're putting the application on a CPU, on a GPU, or on a specialized hardware, the performance is going to be always uh, peaked at the, mem at the speed of the bandwidth. However, when dealing, for example, with uh, computation stages that are going to be memory bound, an obvious solution is merging the computation, grouping the computation together so that you try to reduce as much as possible data movement to main memory. But remember, all of these stages are implemented with different library calls. FFTs have FF, like their own library, library calls, while the sparse linear algebra, they have their own library calls. And merging across these, uh, these stages is going to be complicated. However, if we were to use a similar notation for the computation, we could do these, we can we could reason about these optimizations. So for example, linear algebra notation and linear algebra implementation have been used, for example, for uh, uh, graph analytics. Why can't we use a similar notation, a linear algebra notation to do the 1D and 3D FFTs? In addition to that, we also need, for example, like hardware models that will tell us how to actually block the data, how to actually group the computation as, and use the hardware as efficiently as possible. So the first step I'm going to talk to about is the, the notation used to express the Fourier transform. So everybody knows that the Fourier transform on a one-dimensional Fourier transform is basically a matrix vector multiplication. So you have a column vector of 16 by 1, you multiply with a complex matrix of 16 by 16, and you're going to get your output. Now, typically, this matrix vector multiplication is never done as is because it's an ON, ON, uh, ON squared operation. However, Cooley and Tukey in 1965 came up with a, an algorithm that reduced the complexity from N squared to log of N. However, their expression of summations and grouping the odd terms and the uh, even terms became like it's a very complicated and messy expression. However, the same decomposition can be actually expressed as a group of four linear algebra operations if we view the input, the 1D uh, input, as a two-dimensional matrix. So instead of viewing as a 16 by 1 column vector, if we chop it up into groups of four and stack them together to form a, a, two by, a 4 by 4 matrix, x tilde, we can actually express the Kuritoki algorithm as linear algebra as follows. Well, we apply a Fourier transform in the rows. It's as, as a matrix matrix multiplication. We then pointwise scale the result with these complex uh, twiddle factors, which are simply the roots of unity. We transpose the matrix. And finally, we apply another Fourier transform of size 4 on the row. So it's another matrix matrix multiplication. So this is a linear algebraic notation of the Kulitoki algorithm for a, DFT, uh, a Fourier transform of size 16. The same notation can be actually used to express, for example, three-dimensional DFTs. So instead of viewing it again as a one-dimensional vector, we can view x as x tilde a two-dimensional matrix. We can apply a Fourier transform, a one-dimensional Fourier transform in the row dimension, and then we can apply a two-dimensional DFT, a two by two, into the column dimension. And also moving forward, we can also view the one D as a three-dimensional three-dimensional uh, array. And then the three-dimensional FFT is simply going to be broken as one-dimensional FFTs into the row, columns, and depth. So now we have a notation, and we can use this notation to reason about the, how to merge the computation with the surrounding operations. However, we also need 
on a, an extra step in the idea that we need to understand how the hardware works and hard, the hardware will tell us how to orchestrate the computation. And especially for these kind of operations where um, they are influenced about how fast and how well we use the memory hierarchy, I'm, I'm going to talk about the, uh, an abstract view of the memory hierarchy. And I'm going to start with the registers. So registers are very, very small, uh, what do you call, uh, storages that are, can, are limited like bytes of data that they can store. They're very fast to access like one cycle, but they're very, very expensive. Now, a lower level is going to be the local memory. On a CPU, for example, that's going to be represented by the cache hierarchy. On the GPU, that's going to be represented by the shared memory. And on a hardware, specialized hardware, that can be represented by scratch pad or like uh, context addressable memory or something. This local memory typically is going to be small, medium size, kilobytes to megabytes. It's going to be slower than uh, uh, accessing the memory is going to be slower compared to the register, but it's going to be more affordable. And finally, we're going to have the main memory. And this main memory typically is very large. It's going to be gigabytes, terabytes. It's going to be dirt cheap, but the problem is going to be very, very slow to access. So, for example, problems like the FFTs, we would want to avoid as much as possible moving data back and forth from main memory to the computation. Now, similar to how I presented this pyramid from registers, local memory, and main memory, the code for doing the FFTs is sparse and also doing the optimization should follow a bottom-up approach. The idea that we need to first optimize the codelets, these micro operations like an FFT of size 4, a pointwise operation, using the available registers. Once we have the optimized uh, codelets, what we can do is then we can loop around those codelets so that the amount of data that we're going to work on fits in local memory. So all of these stages, like the FFT of 4 pointwise and FFT, another FFT of, uh, of size 4, are simply going to read and write into the local memory. Once this is going to be efficient, we simply loop one more time across, uh, across the enti this entire block so that we can actually read the data from in memory, block it accordingly, and once it's read, we actually store the computation, store the data in uh, local memory, and again, we work as much as possible from local memory. And these, this principle, this kind of bottom-up approach is uh, like the approach that we use to implement the computation and also kind of like also do the optimizations. So, as I said, we have, we have a notation to express the 3D FFT and the 3D inverse FFT. And also we have this uh, systematic approach of building up the code, starting from codelets, looping around them, uh, uh, guided by how the memory hierarchy is, is working. What can we actually do for these kind of like optimize for these for the computation of this h times i inverse FFT and FFT? Well, instead of actually having eight compute stages, we can actually reduce this whole computation to four stages. So, for example, instead of moving back and forth uh, from main memory, we can apply a one D FFT and immediately afterwards we can apply one of the block sparse operations, or we can apply a one D FFT apply the pointwise computation, apply the block sparse, and then we also apply the 1D FFT, to act, and af only after that, we simply dump the data back to main memory. We improve data locality, so once the data chunk is brought into local memory, we operate as much as possible on that data before uh, writing it back to main memory. Now, the question that one may ask is, will this actually provide any benefits? Well, the answer is yes. So the first experiment that we did was we ran these uh, we ran these optimized versions, the baseline and optimized versions, on a simple CPU like the AMD Ryzen 7 with eight core, 16 threads, running at 3.9 gigahertz. We ran multiple configurations, so the x-axis is the different configurations which one can read like because they're like three numbers grouped together, which is, represents the FFT size, how many batches are we applying the FFT upon, and how many projectors. Recall that we have to do that non-local projectors which are dependent on the atoms of the system and uh, on the y-axis we showed the relative performance according to the baseline implementation that uses vendor tune libraries now in this plot we also want to show that performance can be obtained by simply optimizing the computation in isolation so we replace the vendor tune libraries with our own implementations for the fft and sparse computation and we can easily see that we're getting a performance of 2, 2.5 times faster. 
However, applying the optimizations I outlined in the previous slides, we can get a performance boost on top of the performance obtained by simply looking at the computation in isolation. So for example, we can get like a eight times faster compared to the baseline implementation and somewhere like around 2.5, 2.6 times faster uh, against the actual optimized uh, library implementation. Now, the same op optimizations can be applied on other systems. So for example, in the next experiment, we, with only minor changes to the implementation, we execute the code on, uh, what do you call, on a larger system, an AMD EPIC uh, uh, processor with two sockets, uh, 32 cores, 64 threads. It has a bigger cache, 128 megabytes, and we see similar results. Now for larger sizes, we see like a 12x improvement. Interestingly enough, for smaller sizes, Although we see this performance improvement of two times, three times faster than the baseline, we actually don't see the same kind of boost as the larger size. And this is due to one of the designs in the, in the code, like the data layout, how we actually lay out the data in memory, that will cause problems for smaller sizes. And uh, we believe that like by simply uh, remapping the data using a different data layout, we will get back again the boost in performance. Now, I'm assuming at this point, a lot of you are gonna yawn because well, all of these performance numbers are, are on CPUs, so who cares? However, we actually have results also on accelerators like the NVIDIA Ampere A100. Taking the same implementation and modifying the code using the parameters from the, the, the GPU, so for example, the number of registers, the size of the shared cache, shared memory, uh, and so on and so forth, we can we actually exit, we ran our implementation that our optimized implementation against the, the optimize the baseline implementation that uses uh QFFT library calls for the for for the FFT implementation. And we can see again a performance boost like a two times faster than the actual baseline implementation. Now similar to the AMD case the performance uh, is not uh, what you call it. it can be improved if we were to change the data layout. However, this remains as future work still uh, as future work because it's like uh, it still requires some analysis and some workarounds to the code. So, as we said, the hardware is changing and we need to adapt. And software needs to somehow uh, move from CPUs, GPUs to specialized hardware. And in this presentation. Uh, we showed that, for example, for a computation using like the LS3DF implementation, performance can be improved on the CPU going from an AMD Ryzen processor to an AMD EPIC processor. With simple modifications and rearrangements of the, the parameters guided by the architecture, like the, by, the, the, by our analytical models, we showed also performance improvement of two times over the baseline on GPUs. But most important, we learn lessons from both the CPU and the GPU, and we have our, like, we kind of obtain like a bag of tricks that we can also pull moving forward to other systems like the Samba Nova chip or GraphCore or even implementing our, our hardware because we want to kind of merge the benefits, the uh, best of both worlds from the CPU and the GPU. Now, while these optimizations were applied on only one application that uses uh, sparse computation and FFTs, also other applications from molecular dynamics, particle and cell mass simulation, stress strain can utilize these methods because some of these computations will also have FFTs as well. So the techniques presented is here, notation plus the methodology of systematically applying the optimizations can be applied on these other computations. And for example, projects like the FFTX project can utilize these techniques and offer performance improvements. So before concluding, I would like to thank, first of all, the LDRD, DF, like the DFT Beyond Moore's Law for offering the funding. And I would like to thank uh, the, my, my four collaborators. And to conclude, uh, the talk was uh, the, the, the the focus of the talk was to optimize memory bond operations by somehow merging them and show in this talk I show that well using two techniques having a similar notation like this linear algebra notation for the computation and using an analytical model to guide the optimizations we can obtain performance on CPU and GPUs. In addition, we learn important lessons that will help us optimize for future systems and also build future systems.
Thank you so much.